It's so interesting to see, too, isn't it? That as the Democrats beat the oppression drum and claim to be standing up for the victimized in this remarkably moral manner, they're in fact alienating exactly the people that they claim to support. First of all, the working class, because they did a cataclysmic job of alienating the working class, especially in the Clinton campaign. It was something stunning to watch, and now exactly the same thing is happening on the minority front. So the very people whose tender mercies are supposed to be being targeted by this victimization narrative are the people who, as soon as they understand it, do everything they possibly can to reject it. Embark on a profound exploration with Jordan Peterson as he navigates the intricate web of challenges facing the Western world and its political landscape. In this enlightening video, with his characteristic blend of insight and clarity, Peterson delves into the core issues plaguing Western societies, from cultural divisions to economic disparities. But I think that's happening in part because among the graduate school educated elites, you're really dealing with a secular religion rather than a political movement. Therefore, you have all of the fervor and intensity and blindness of a religious movement. So they have to assume that these other people are just wrong. They can't hear them because the message being sent to them by minorities and by working class whites are messages which are heresy given their secular religion. I think that's at the heart of this. That's why you kind of have somebody like Bill Gates say recently that it's really good. We have these really high prices for fossil fuels because that's really going to lead people to understand how important greenism is. Well, you know, if you're a family that's going to have an electric blackout or you're somebody who can't afford to buy heating oil, you somehow think a billionaire telling you how good it is for you to be in pain is probably pretty stupid. Yeah, well, you know, the deputy prime minister in Canada, Christian Freeland, said exactly the same thing about high gas prices in Canada at the pump. It's like it's good for people to pay a little bit more when they're filling up their car because it helps them understand just how serious the climate crisis is. It looks to me like what happens is that the sacred collapses into the political such that the political becomes sacred for those who are a religious. It's inevitable. I've been thinking about this from a psychological perspective. If you imagine that we have a hierarchy of conception such that some things we perceive and conceive of are shallow and other things are deep, and the deep things are those upon which many ideas are dependent, constitutional axioms, for example, in that manner would be deep, and the self-evident presuppositions upon which the constitutional axioms are predicated would even be deeper. The deeper down you go, the more it becomes religious in some real sense. There's no getting away from depth in that manner, because without that hierarchy of depth, you have a kind of incoherence at best. So there's no getting away from the religious if you think about it technically in that manner. If you don't have a religious story or a religious substrate, then it seems to me that what happens is the political starts to become the substitute for that depth. Then we get into a situation where we can't even talk about political things anymore because it becomes taboo. That seems to be part of this secularized religion. That's part of activism. It's part of this insane insistence on climate remediation before everything else including providing food and shelter and energy to the poor. That seems to be what's being rejected in mass by the working class and also now increasingly by minority voters. I mean, Dennis Prager has a very nice formula. He says, big God, small government. Big government, small God. In a way, when I described big government socialism in my most recent book, I was trying to get at this notion. What you have in some ways is the ferocity of the Reformation. You have the kind of attitude which was captured in a man for all seasons, where the son-in-law is asked, 
Would you knock down a law to get at the devil? And he says, of course. And then would you knock down the next law? And then when you finally end up having driven the devil all the way to Wales, he turns. What is going to stand between you and him now that you've knocked down all the laws? I think what you have on the left is the ferocity of the Reformation, the ferocity of the French Revolution at its peak.